um, you know, we have to have that freedom of speech in science. We have to have the ability to have scientists comfortable criticizing ideas. That doesn't exist currently as we stand. So, for example, there's, there are many prominent scientists who speak about this environment. Like for, Thomas Nagel calls it, people have been browbeaten into accepting the, the current status quo. Uh, Masutashi Nai, uh, someone who is an, a heavyweight when it comes to popula population genetics, a uh, Japanese scientist, you know, he says Darwin is a god in biology. You cannot challenge uh, Darwin. You know, Lynn Margulis says, you know, history is going to judge neo-Darwinism as an Anglo-Saxon sect. So, you know, we get all these scientists speaking about this environment. Um, and what we need to realize is they're also human beings. So these scientists who want to use science and this mantle to promote atheism, they are going to do things similar to religious people. They are going to go on witch hunts. They are going to treat Darwinism as a religion. Um, there's, there's one book I wanted to speak about, which is Michael Roos's excellent book, um, Darwinism as Religion. And he basically argues that Darwinism from its inception to today has acted as a secular religi religious perspective, as a actual religion. So we have to keep this in mind. It's not just science, right? There's way more than science. If we look at it historically, social Darwinism and how it is used to justify imperialism, and then currently evolutionary psychology with all of its, you know, um, just so stories and, and, and documentaries that you see with all these ideas of, okay, color evolution was due to this particular thing that happened in the Paleolithic era. All this stuff is just completely unjustifiable. It's because they start off with the assumption, essentially, of naturalism. They turn the assumption into a conclusion. They work backwards and they jerry all the data. And what that leads to is a suffocation for the, the academic environment that you actually need for scientists to challenge some things which they need to challenge. And Paul, I just want to give you one example. Because um, uh, as you can imagine, I have a lot to say, but I just want to give you one example of how this is terrible, terrible for science. Junk DNA was used as an argument against God for many years, right? Philip Kitcher, uh, you know, he said if uh, most of our genome is junk and therefore God needs to go back to school, just ridiculous things like this, right? For decades. And it was discouraged to actually look into junk DNA, right, as, as something that may be functional. Now, on my website, um, I've actually, that was my thesis at Birkbeck. I actually did it on junk DNA. What, and, is, your, what is your website? Can you just give us the title uh, of your yeah, website? It's, it's, just, it's just my name. It's my name.com, right? Right. So okay. if you put in my name and then, uh, for, so this is, um, and again, I, you know, peer review all of that. It was peer reviewed. It's been published. I got a distinction for this, right? Um, published as in, uh, published as in it was, uh, it was accepted. And I'm going to be, inshallah, um, I'm looking for a science journal to actually, actually publish this in. Um, so in this paper, uh, you will see all the references there. You'll see all the arguments there. What you find is that junk DNA was not accepted, was, was accepted categorically, but science should never be categorical, should never be categorical. In 2012, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements by, uh, it was led by Francis Collins, a Christian and Darwinist. Um, he basically showed um, with the other researchers that junk a DNA, these sequences were not actually junk. They were non-coding proteins and they were actually functional. They actually had purpose. And us making that paradigm shift was going to have lots of non-epistemic implications for health. It was going to help us understand diabetes and other types of diseases. So for many, many years, Darwinists suffocated um, the environment so that junk DNA was accepted as junk. Yet later on, when that assumption was challenged, we understood that junk is not junk, it's actually functional and it has these amazing traits. It switches genes on and off. And, and it, I mean, if if one was to actually look at, um, oh, if one was to come up with an example, it's like me telling you, Paul, just down the road, there's a junkyard. Don't go in there. It's all a bunch of broken up cars and this type of thing. You one day decide to go against my advice. I'm the scientific advisor. I'm, I'm creating the environment. I'm, I'm the one with the research funding, I'm, I'm you know, in control. You decide to go there, get a screwdriver, break the lock, walk in, what are you going to see? You're going to see diamonds, you're going to see gold, you're going to see you know, uh, gems, rubies, you're going to see these things. That's what we've discovered with junk DNA. Junk DNA is a treasure trove. And it was denied to us epistemically mm. because well, 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 of well, Darwinian well, assumptions.